Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at radars and jamming. Now we've done a lot of stuff on ESM and OECM and DECM in the past, and that's not really what I want to focus on today. Instead what I want to concentrate is the concept of wavelength and how different jammers are going to affect different types of wavelengths and actually have different degrees of jamming. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'll go ahead and take a look at our scenario here. I have a group of different radars all kind of queued up here. I have a B-band. Uh, this is an EWR radar, a very, 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 very large early warning radar with, if I recall correctly, it's about 320 nautical mile range. This is a theater early warning radar kind of a thing. And it's also on the B-band. Uh, come on over here. We have an I-band. Uh, this one is uh, pretty classic right here. This is a high screen. Uh, the reason we pulled this sucker out is because it's a completely different wavelength. This one down here, this is the G-band. This is the dog ear. This is kind of like a short range kind of heads up radar for a bunch of infrared missile systems. Systems. And of course, if we come down here, of course, I'm going to include the TPS-43 because it is the radar. And the big thing about this one to note about, of course, is we're looking at the E and the F band. We actually have two different bands that we can operate this particular one on. Now, the reason I pull these all out is because we have two aircraft that are going to be inconveniencing these radars today. The first one on the north here is the uh, Sukhoi-30 um, MKM. Now, this one's from Malaysia. And if you make a look on board, it's got this handy dandy little uh, jamming pod built into it. Now this is an OECM jamming pod. You notice right here, it's called a SAP 518. What you're gonna notice is our SAP 518 is OECM, which means it's gonna create that active noise to try to jam the enemies. And you're also gonna notice that it only operates on G, H, I, and J. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this guy real quickly. I'm gonna go ahead and flip him on real fast. Let's go ahead and pop that sucker on to OECM mode. Boop, 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 boop. And the little jam lights kind of pop on here to announce that he has activated his offensive jamming mechanism. Now, if I switch back to the other team and I'm pause real quickly here, you're gonna notice that nothing bad happens. Uh, the reason nothing bad happened is because none of these radars are currently energized. A radar must be energized to be jammed. Now I know pros will actually say it's more complicated than that. I get it, 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 it is more complicated than that. I know it's more complicated than that. Thank you, GeForce, I needed that. But the big thing to know about that is the fact that within our context, we don't have to stress out about that too much. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on. And now we notice immediately that if you look down at our radars, that two of our radars are instantaneously jammed. Our dog ear radar is jammed, and we can also see down here that our high screen radar is jammed. But we also observe that our tall rack is doing fine. And if we come over here to our SIPS 43, it is completely unaffected by the actual incoming frequencies. And you're sitting there going, but, but, but it's jamming. They should all be jammed. Well, a couple things we can notice. First of all, we have no issue identifying these targets, getting their altitude, all those things. As a matter of fact, if we come over here, we can see very, very clearly that our tips is pointing them up and our tall rack is having no difficulty identifying them. On the flip side, our high screen here is just, it, it's useless, it's not doing anything. And if we come down here to the dog ear, we can see the dog ear is slightly out of range. So the dog ear wouldn't be able to pick them up anyway. So the jamming is working on that particular frequency. As a matter of fact, if we wanted to kick this up a little bit bigger here, I can actually delete my little group here. That's perfectly fine. Now the nice thing is here is they should remember, yeah, they keep their radars on. I'm actually gonna shut off the radars on the end here. Let's go ahead and shut that one off. Let's go ahead and shut this one off. Now, if I pause and unpause again, um, these targets are no longer being tracked by our good friend, the TIPS-43, as well as the Nebo here. Now, you'll notice this guy right here on the right is still acquirable. Now, that's because the high screen's got a pretty good look at him. Remember that the jamming coming from our friend over here is actually over here, and this bogey right here is no longer in the line of sight of this protective jammer. If I wanted to uh, simulate that a little differently, I could actually grab him and do one of those kind of things. And then if I let time kind of pass just a little bit, we'll uh, slowly um, have a tougher time acquiring this target. Remember, this particular jamming technology works best on the thing that it's jamming for, not necessarily blanketing out whole sections like you've probably seen another one. Like this one, we're still able to identify them pretty effectively. Although I think, uh, let's see, tall rack, that was 40 seconds ago. Yeah, we're in good shape. So. Let's go swing over here. Now, another thing I want to point out here is even though my two radars in the end that aren't being jammed are off, I can still detect this target. Now, the reason for that is just because you're jammed doesn't mean you're completely jammed. Uh, that's just kind of a common misconception. Obviously, there's a little line coming down your screen and you're probably getting the little three boxes down the center saying, hey, somebody's making it difficult to track something. And we also notice that the target that's doing the jamming is actually basically dropped off our scopes here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back to my radars here. I'm gonna switch back to the other sweet team real fast. I will grab these guys. They're doing a lovely job, absolutely killing it today. I'm gonna go ahead and shut them off real fast here. Shut off those jammers. I'll go swing back to the other team real fast. And we should be able to reacquire our opponents here because uh, they're no longer engaging our, in our jamming exercise. 
Ah, oh, there they are. Ah, got them. So we can you now acquire both opponents, no problem, because again, remember, all of our radars are happily, actually, they're not jamming anymore. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna flip on my radars in the end again. And again, um, this is a pretty pretty heavy duty uh, set of early warning radars. This is not unusual, by the way. You always wanna make sure you have multiple frequencies to make things interesting for your opponents. So now we've got all of our radars running right now. Uh, they're ticking away kind of a thing. We'll switch back to the other team. And now we're gonna grab that other aircraft. Uh, this is an EF-111 Raven. Uh, these, uh, they don't use these anymore, but they're kind of a neat plane. Look at the pond on the back of this. It's so cool. You can actually see it's back from the 80s here. And what we know on board here is we have an ANALQ-99 Echo here. And what we can observe is it jams all the different frequencies, with, of course, there's some exceptions up here in the radio frequency spectrum we're not going to get. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that EF-111 here. I'll go ahead and flip on his jammer. And what that will do is that will cause him to go ahead and do a multiple spectrum attack here. Now, if I come down here, you'll notice every single one of my radars is now being jammed. Um, but the other thing you probably observe very obviously is the fact that it did not cause these aircraft to have any ambiguity in position. It's not causing any ambiguity in uh, not being able to target them or anything like that. As a matter of fact, if you come up here, you'll realize that every single one of my radar platforms is happily locking on, especially our tall rack here. The tall rack has a really easy time of it because I believe the power output of the tall rack is extremely high. So if I were to actually take this one out of the running for a second here, shut that one off real quick. Uh, okay, we're still getting a good look at the Sukhoi going around here, but the EF-111, now we've lost that one completely. Just, it's gone. We just don't have the sheer power that can burn through the jamming at this particular range. Now, obviously, if I took these aircraft and I sent them out to sea a little bit further here, they'd be harder to pick up just because the power of the jamming would overwhelm them. But the important thing I wanted you to observe is the fact that that frequency does matter. If we're jamming on something that doesn't have an accurate if we're, not, if we're jamming on I and the thing is on A, we're never going to get a success as far as um, being able to block that radar from identifying a particular position. That's a really important concept that a lot of people miss. There's one other point that I want to point out that's actually kind of interesting, and I'm not 100% sure how accurate this is. But the reality is we have radars on many, many, many different uh, spectrums here. We have EFF, we have I, G, we have I, and we also have B. Now, for a jammer to be able to get all of those frequencies that far apart in the spectrum is a really impressive piece of technology. You know, one of the things they have on real jammers that makes them a little more challenging is you only have a very, very narrow bandwidth in which to work. So if, for example, you targeted the G-band, you just got G-band. You wouldn't be able to target the other ones depending on the nature of the technology. Now, one of the things you probably see here is every time our aircraft turns to a specific position, we kind of lose it a little bit and then we get it back again. A lot of that has to do with the fact that the cross-section of the aircraft changes as we actually condense our little rotation here. We can pick up the aircraft easier from the bottom and the side than we can pick one that's right on our noses, for example. So it creates this kind of interesting little kind of as it kind of completes its rotation here. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, what if you turn on both jammers at the same time? Well, let's see what happens here. We'll go to sensors. We'll go ahead and flip this one on. We'll unpause here. We're now jamming on both. And now we're going to pop this back, and we'll see exactly what happens here. I'll let this scenario run out a little bit. And now we're noticing uh, we're getting some really strange ambiguity here. Now, notice when we beamed the radars, uh, we had no difficulty identifying them. But as we start to change our little perspective here, you can see the ambiguity kicks in because of the fact that we have a smaller radar cross-section when we're pointing away in it. So it actually, if you synchronize these properly, you can create a really fun effect where you basically, uh, right there should be about the sweet spot, where it's going to make it very, very difficult to get a quality track for the purposes of actually engaging. Now, the last thing we'll take a look at here, and let me go ahead and get myself with the proper tool for this, and we're going to grab ourselves an SA-21 here. Now, the reason I want to pull out the SA-21, other than the fact 12 transport erector launchers, are you kidding me, is to point out that attack radars often have a very different frequency than search radars do. If we actually pop this one open real quick and scroll down, we'll see here our cheese board, which is our air search is on G and H. And you'll see our gravestone, which is the one that does the deed, is on I for the purposes of illumination. It's on G for the purposes of search and track. Now, most jammers work on those frequencies. So now if I were actually to grab this, drag a box like that to order the attack, what this guy will actually do is he will flip on his radar and try to go ahead and get an acquisition here. We'll go ahead and give him a little push. You can see even though he is jammed, um, that's more than a quality track. And the SAM is already on its way. You can see just how concentrated the fire control radars are versus our conventional radars. Now, the interesting piece here, and I think you'll get a kick out of this, is even though we're jamming like crazy, 
these missiles, if we're actually click on one of these real fast, you'll observe that the weapon seeker is also on the I band. So that would mean if we have a jamming system that doesn't work on the I band, uh, this would be kind of an interesting little waste of time. Oh, they're running. We got runners. <laughs> and you could see, um, unfortunately, we were not able to run them down. But you can also see just how, even though we have all this technology, we are still able to basically create a little bit of a situation where we can't, um, we're not going to get that free cheap shot here because of the fact that they're working so hard. So hopefully this has been helpful. Like I said, jamming is complicated and there's a lot of things that have been simplified. There's other types of jamming. Uh, for example, we can do an electronic attack in the sense where we create a bunch of duplicates of ourselves in the air. Um, that's not simulated directly in command at this time, but there's also a hundred like different other variations of how you can make these guys' job very challenging. But again, they've simplified that because so much of that is classified, but the general concepts and the general effectiveness in the scenario stay the same. Enjoy.